Hello, everybody, and welcome to the seventh episode of Kato's Anime Cafe, where every Monday we sit down and discuss anything and everything anime. I'm your host, Odie Song, as always, joined by my partner in crime, Zero. Today's episode is brought to you by the Tax Defense Group. The team of professionals at the Tax Defense Group are passionate about helping taxpayers resolve their tax debt. Their services include basic tax preparation, tax audits, resolving large tax debt, and more. They actively represent taxpayers throughout the entire USA, so if you need help resolving your tax issues, contact the Tax Defense Group. Call the Tax Defense Group today at 800-850-7973 to get started. That number again is 800-850-7973, or you could visit them online at thetaxdefensegroup.com. Today's episode is also brought to you by Writer Junkie. Are you thinking about starting a business or a side hustle? For all businesses to be successful, you need a website. Writer Junkie offers website development, content writing, and SEO services for business websites. Call Writer Junkie today at 805-587-7966 and you can visit them online at writerjunkie.com. Thank you to the Tax Defense Group and Writer Junkie for sponsoring this week's episode. We also recently launched our website, ucaststudios.com. With articles about sports, special interest topics, and more, we have some cool stuff on the site. So to read our content, please visit ucaststudios.com. Now, let's get back into it. Zero, this week we have a very special guest, someone who we've sort of floated around for basically our entire career on YouTube, never quite getting the chance to collaborate until today, that is. Of course, it is the fantastic anime YouTuber, host of the Nen Show podcast. Mathwiz, thank you for joining us. How's it going? I am existing. I am alive. I am here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how's it going on your end with the uh, pandemic? I mean, I don't want to dig too deep into your personal life, but are you binging 36 episodes of anime every night or are you uh <laughs> crying in your sleep what's going on well the the store that i work at was like closed for two weeks and then we opened back up and um yeah so basically my uh i don't know it's weird like my actual like quarantine quarantine of like not being able to work was only like the two weeks and i've been working pretty much um but it's been eh, you know i'm not one who goes out a ton so it's kind of like I don't know. It, it's definitely weird when I do go out, but I feel like I don't go out enough for it to like fully. Uh, I don't know. It, it's 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 weird for everybody, but I don't know. I feel like <laughs> on the spectrum of who is being impacted the most, I feel like I'm maybe more towards the eh, just kind of existing. Yeah, it's almost a, a bittersweet thing with a lot of anime video game neats i guess for lack of a better word is where it it feels like oh you know this isn't really affecting me so who cares and then it's the crushing realization afterwards where it's like hold on there's a pandemic in the world everyone's panicking and my life mm -hmm. is not changed is that how mm -hmm. pathetic my life is on a day-to-day -day <laughs> basis already <laughs> zero how's the pandemic going for you quarantine and whatnot i have really been enjoying wearing masks i feel like kakashi on the daily <laughs> Honestly, masks are an aesthetic that people don't appreciate enough. So I've definitely Absolutely. gained an appreciation for it. I'm inclined I'm to I'm just going to keep wearing masks. Yeah, I feel like I might just keep doing it. <laughs> masks have given me the opportunity to grow out my beard for the first time in my life, which might have been a double-edged sword because uh, perhaps I shouldn't because when I showed it to Zero for the first time, I said, what are your honest thoughts? And just plain out, he said, it's bad. So oh, no. <laughs> maybe, maybe the mask wasn't a good idea and maybe I should just uh, continue to be my old baby face self. Yeah, I can't, I can't even imagine hoodie with a beard. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Math was every week on the Anime Cafe, we take a look at some of the most popular threads on Reddit's r slash anime and give our thoughts on the conversation. Zero, can you go ahead and read us the first thread by Koro Sensei 200? Oh, right. I was supposed to have the anime threads ready. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then I will go ahead and just read that first thread for us. No problem. Uh, Koro Sensei 200 says, what was your first anime? It's a very simple question, very introductory, but I figured we have a guest on. Might as well just get some introductory elements to the podcast, considering we haven't even really introduced ourselves in any of these episodes yet. So, Matt, was, what was your first anime? How old are you, if you don't mind me asking? I am 22. Oh, same age as us. Okay, so we probably have very similar uh anime backgrounds where did you start uh well uh technically technically uh it would be like pokemon or um dragon ball z one of the two mm -hmm. i don't know they were both something i came across in my childhood but like the first anime knowing it was anime i always say sword art online found it back in like 2014 ish and uh yeah it was an anime that's interesting it's something i've always heard people starting with sword art online but i never really 
experience does that does that mean just for like most of your child life other than the basic you know americanized anime cartoons that we all watched you weren't like you weren't really experiencing stuff like the tsunami block or whatever yeah so like there were occasions where i would come across like naruto um like later in the evening uh, but at the time like i didn't really know much about it i might have followed like a couple episodes i think i probably saw mm. some stuff like i can faintly recollect coming across like the episode where gara fights lee um and just remembering like certain imagery like i had probably seen it before um but otherwise no i never really like picked up much of an interest in it or didn't really like didn't really come across anybody who was really like super into it up until like middle school or high school when someone finally sat me down like we were just hanging out and he was just like hey do you watch any anime uh and that was just kind of how i got into it so Sword Art Online 2014, has it just been consistent since then, the past six years? You never really fell out or anything? Yeah, no, I've been keeping up with it uh, pretty consistently. Um, you know, it started with like Sword Art, uh, Death Note, Attack on Titan, Full Metal Alchemist, you know, like the yeah. big ones. And then slowly, I kind of found my way in from there. Didn't start getting into seasonals until winter 2016 with Erased. Uh, and ever since then, I've just kind of been, you know, going through anime. Yeah, I I ended up falling out of anime. Unlike you, I was watching anime a lot younger, but I ended up not really sticking with it through, I would say, maybe like middle school to early high school. But I know, Zero, we have a lot in common for how we started anime, but you never fell out either. You were always pretty much watching, right, Zero? Yeah, I didn't really have a period where I wasn't uh, watching shows, whether it was like Rewatching Death Note and Code Geass a billion times, or watching something new to me like One Outs. Mm. I always like. I also didn't really get into seasonals. I never, and still don't watch what's coming out now. But I try to find new anime to expose myself to. So, what was your first? Was it Naruto? Well, <laughs> I sort of started watching anime habitually so early in my life that I don't even know what the first show I would have been exposed to was. Um, certainly Dragon Ball Z would have been around, and both my older brothers also watched anime, which contributes to this problem. But my real beginning to my anime journey starts two generations ago, when my grandmother watched Akira and well, with my mother, and uh, that sort of developed a lifelong interest in anime that my mother sort of passed down to me she was like hey do you know people in japan make good animation i was like oh that's cool <laughs> man all these yeah, I've... people been out here watching anime uh for since like oh i've been watching since 2005 i've been watching since whatever zero's got generations ahead of people <laughs> <laughs> i love it um, I've known your mom for a long time. In fact, I, weirdly enough, I've known your mom longer than I've known you, Zero, because uh, she was <laughs> a true. counselor. Yeah, she was a counselor at an after-school program I went to. And the one thing I'll say about your mom, which this is probably the thing I envy most about your life, is that your mom is like a bona fide, like, real, she's really into nerdy stuff. You know, she loves anime, she loves Wonder Woman, she loves comic books and all that. In fact, I would say maybe not, you know, as a functioning adult, maybe not as much as us, but like I could see how that, that seed was planted within you at a very young age. Unlike me, where, you know, my grandpa, he he watched Naruto with me, but in the sense like, uh, oh, uh, this is, you know, a dumb cartoon my grandson wants to watch. I guess I'll pity him and pretend I care at all about <laughs> it. But uh, not the case for you, I guess, Zero. Yeah, I used to watch Toonami with my mom. And also, again, my brothers introduced me to stuff like Naruto tried to get me into one piece but that never happened and i guess the joke's on me <laughs> yeah you <laughs> idiot now you're all obsessed with one piece like all of us yeah um, <laughs> so my first anime like like you said math was if, if we're not counting like pokemon Yu Gi Oh, all that and i would say even not counting naruto because i think naruto definitively is anime but as a kid i would have probably grouped it in that same area of pokemon and Yu Gi Oh. um i would say my journey with anime starts in like 2007 2008 with back in the days of youtube where you looked up episodes and they're broken up into like three to seven parts five to ten minutes each and i remember distinctly when i think about that 
the thing I think about is school days. Mathos, are you familiar with school days? <laughs> I'm familiar oh, with school days, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it is it is the pinnacle uh trashy harem type thing. At the time it was controversial whether or not this was the most deep anime anyone's ever seen, or it was the trash that I think people nowadays <laughs> kind of realize it always was. Uh, but I kind of want to tie this into the second Reddit thread because School Days is very much my answer for this one, which is by the Epic Noob, who says, what made you love watching anime? And it feels almost dirty to say this. Oh, I bet, but I, very I, bet much... I know this. It was the boat. The boat? Do you not know about the boat <laughs> the meme? The boat. I have no idea what the boat you is. You don't know about Nice Boat? The boat in School Days? The boat in School Days. Oh, 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 you mean the boat at the end of the show where... Well, she did you not know had... that when like it first aired, um, because of like the the violence and the ending, like they, I forget exactly what the specifics of it were, but like they aired, it was I forget what it was, but the final scene was just like a boat, like just footage, live action footage of like a boat. Um, I've never seen this. Probably from... they probably used it to Sorry. censor the actual ending. Yeah, so the ending I know is in the ending I always saw. Maybe I just got lucky and found an uncensored version or something. But it was uh, spoilers for anyone who cares about school days, I guess, is that she did have his head in a bag and they drifted away on a boat. But it very much was an animated boat. And they're very much actually, I don't think they showed the head. I think it was just a black, but it was very clear that. Well, yeah, his head was yeah, in that the was the that was like the actual ending. Uh, I think it was just like the TV broadcast. or I don't know specifically what the details of it were, but somewhere it was broadcast where like that was censored. Um which also makes it really funny that the fact that it does end with them on a boat, uh, her with the severed head, because then it like it, it all comes full circle. There's a couple <laughs> alternate endings, too. So the thing about School Days is that, uh, I, from my understanding, it's a visual novel. So there are a lot of alternate endings, and there are a lot of uh, animated scenes that I have found later in my life that were definitely not in the version of the show on YouTube that I saw. Uh, that's as much I'll say about that. Very, very uh, not PG scenes. Um, so there are a lot of alternate endings. And School Days, I, I'm ashamed to admit this, but as a kid, you know, this was back in 2007, 2008, I would have been like 10 to 12 years old. As a kid, oh, I was craving that preteen melodrama. Oh, I just loved it. I love this, this, this not even a love triangle, it was a love octagon. <laughs> There's so many things, like so many, so much terrible, ter- in hindsight, so much awful storytelling, so much <laughs> awful writing involved. But at the time, at the time, that was that was my lifeblood, man. I got so into it. And that made me love anime because there was, there was no American cartoon that was going to be you know, severed heads and, uh, you know, love and sex like there was in school days. That, that was not something I'd find anywhere on an American TV show. So to get this and to realize, whoa, they're doing what in Japan? They got what? <laughs> that was that opened the doors for a whole new world. So that I would say school days and then perhaps another shameful part of my past is how deep into role playing Soul Leader I was. Oh my god i was i was i had 13 maybe up, upwards of 20 soul leader role play accounts on facebook and every day i was in there every day i was just typing up a storm i've written more as a teenager pretending to be <laughs> justin law from soul leader than i have now actually creating comics and whatnot so i would say my very shameful past of interacting with things like school days soul leader that's that's what made me love anime, and you know what? I think we just got to accept. But hoodie, that. can we find any of these accounts of your old role playing Soul Eater? <laughs> oh, I'll I link you. <laughs> I need the receipts. I need to see the receipts. I really hope they don't exist. I, I, I don't think I ever like went through and deactivated all of them. But you would have to figure. You would have to search up the characters that Zero probably knows I role played as, and then you would have to figure out which one. Could be me because there's so many because that's the thing about the Soul Eater community. I don't know if this exists for any other anime, and I don't even know why Soul Eater specifically picked up like this. But the Soul Eater community role playing on Facebook was insanely big, it was massive. So I don't even know if it'd be possible to even locate any of them. Yeah, it would be difficult to track them down because I wasn't really interacting with those accounts. It'd be a lot easier to find the Naruto ones. <laughs> you didn't need to say that. Oh, there's more. <laughs> <didn't need> to... <laughs> there's more. This is all the podcast is about now. I gotta, I gotta hear this. I gotta hear all no, about. You wanna know... a whole episode on hoodies, roleplay accounts. <laughs> Soul Eater. We're just gonna expose each other. 
<laughs> yeah, Soul Eater, I was young. I was young and foolish. Naruto, I have no excuse. I was 16, 17. I mean, that was as recent as like eight, uh, six years ago. So, uh, Zero, why don't you tell them about your roleplay days, huh? <laughs> okay, okay. So I started with Death Note. Actually, no. I started with uh, Black Butler. Huh. I, yeah, I started with uh, CL Phantom High because the blue aesthetic and the chest thing... I was just like this guy, he's he's kind of cool. And <laughs> then I it does moved sort of to Death seem Note like, pretty quickly. Uh, Black Butler does sort of seem like it would be Code Geass light. I've never seen Black Butler, and I've only seen a little bit of Code Geass, but that seems to check out for me. I don't really have much of an interest in Black Butler anymore. I haven't even seen it in years to say if it's good or not. But I was in that community for a very short-lived period. Then mm. I moved over to Naruto. Oh no, not Naruto. I moved over to Death Note, where I was role playing near, and yeah, that sounds very on brand. Years for you. later, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I have not changed since I was eleven years old. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I spent a few years uh, role playing near. Then, um, me and Hoodie got into the Naruto stuff, uh, even making OCs, and oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly uh, cringe-filled misadventures, but it was a lot of fun. It deepened our love for anime, and... I would say it deepened our love for each other. I think we, we went through war together, you know? We went, <laughs> yeah. Uh, we went through some terrible times, and we're a stronger duo for it, Zero. Now wait, was this, like, metaphorically, or literally, as in, like, the war in the show? Like, is this... <laughs> <laughs> I would say there was... We never got around to it, but there was a point in time where someone like someone created a group of Naruto role players and it was going to be this massive like you know couple dozen people role playing out an alternate universe of the war and I was role playing this never happened but I had an account for Sai so I was going to be role playing Sai and um I'm assuming zero you were still you were Kakashi at that point I don't know Yeah Kakashi is like my main Naruto character that I used pretty much exclusively for years yeah, so we're just a bunch of big losers. Is, I guess, so I'm, <laughs> I'm yes. very interested in this like subculture of like role playing now because like I mean I've heard about it but not like ever much. But it seems like there's like so much that you could do with that, and it's just I don't know. It just seems really interesting. I it's think definitely a lot... like. Uh, Sorry, you go, go ahead. ahead. Okay, I'll go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's definitely a lot that I would say. I'd say right now I'm I'm net negative. I don't think it's. A productive use of many people's times i'd rather just see people writing but as a kid who maybe needs quote-unquote training wheels as young teenagers who want to play and around play around in someone else's world and who can maybe find a pathway into writing through using a single carrot only i do think there is some value i do think there is probably a lot of fun to be had i would say right now at my age not that i'm that old but uh, people around my age i would say you should probably, I mean, even just write fan fiction, it just, I, I don't know, role play just seems a little limiting to me, but I guess in the idea of training wheels, I could see how for little kids, or not not even little kids, but like, I would say maybe like 8 to 15, I could see how it be, it could be a uh, fun activity that does have some educational value. Yeah, and I can say from my experience that there's definitely a lot of creativity poured into it. Yeah, I guess the, the biggest thing I just don't like about it, and we've had this conversation zero, but the biggest thing I don't like about it is I feel like it's a it's a brand of writing that I think could develop some bad habits. And I think specifically I refer to the idea of like playing tag. So you're you are sending a couple messages and then your role play partner is sending a couple messages and that back and forth I think is not representative of of how actual good storytelling should be like I because I think there's in uh there's a pressure there for each person to submit equal amounts of story and I don't think that's always the best way to to tell a story you know like if for example if I'm role-playing Naruto and you're role-playing Sasuke or let's say Naruto and you're role-playing uh Kakashi it's not always the best for the story for us to be for Naruto and Kakashi to be talking and interacting at the same amount. Sometimes uh, sometimes Naruto needs to do a little bit more. Sometimes Kakashi needs to do a little bit more. And I feel like that that 
isn't exactly how the system of role playing is set up on a social level. I don't know why any of this matters. I don't even know what I'm talking about this. <laughs> yeah, it was not pl- scheduled for us to talk about our role playing <laughs> shame on this podcast. <laughs> Mathwiz, tell us why you love anime. Surely it wasn't Sword Art Online. Or maybe it was. was well, here's was that the where... part where I talk about how I got into the Sword Art Online role-playing community. That is not a real thing. That <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think as far as like what made me love anime, like when I, what was like, I think it was probably Death Note was like the first series where like I watched it. Granted, this was like my second or third anime at the time, but like I, the first thing that I watched and I was like, yes, I want to check out more of this. Like when I watched Sword Art Online, it's like, okay, still kind of interested in it, not quite diving in uh, headfirst yet. But with Death Note, um, you know, it's just a very easy series to binge. And it was just, you know, it's just a different kind of storytelling, a different perspective. And eventually I got into stuff, you know, other stories, these big epics like Full Metal Alchemist and, um, Hunter Hunter, definitely my bread and butter. Um, so I don't know, like as far as anime goes, it's just I just realized I've been talking away from the mic this whole time. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it sounds <laughs> roughly fine for me, so I don't think it was that bad. But yeah, uh, I don't know. Anime, it's just cool. You get to see uh, different types of stories from. I guess anime specifically is like the introduction to other cultures and just being able to mm-hmm. um, get. You know, obviously, anime doesn't tell you everything you need to know about Japanese culture, but it gives you, like, the the breadcrumbs to, like, dig into it further. Um, I don't exactly Definitely. know where I'm going with this. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Zero. Uh, just to piggyback off that for a moment, I have definitely learned more about Japanese culture that I have in history class, or from anime than I have in history class, just watching shows like Shur no Toki Mutsu and Neiryu or Sengoku Basura. There's. It's just. I know who Musashi Miyamoto is now. <laughs> well, but... I would say that, uh, unlike you losers, I would say I'm a very cultured person. <laughs> I, I, know, I know everything I need to know about Japan exclusively from Yu Gi Oh! <laughs> so <laughs> I think I was, from a very early age, I think I was uh, pretty much an expert on all this stuff. Maybe you could relate to this, Mathwiz, but uh, I would say my, like, outside of the shameful past I just revealed, I would say my true love for anime, how I love it now, is birthed from the YouTube channel, where it was like, I, I had mentioned earlier that I sort of fell out with anime after, after my horrible, horrible time in a uh, post traumatic time, really, in. <laughs> Role playing. <laughs> <laughs> I fell out with anime a little bit, but I got back in with the idea that, you know what, this is a field worth talking about. Maybe we can make some videos on it. That was sort of the inception of, of Kato. And I started rewatching them. I don't remember what the first I got to was. Maybe it was like No Game, No Life or something. But around there, I started watching Haikyuu and stuff. And it was with the idea that, okay, this is stuff I want to analyze and really learn to appreciate, where talk about culture where I was starting to learn about the people behind anime, not just like, Oh, you know, Shonen was probably like the most deep, like the deepest term I knew in terms of anime production when I was a younger kid. And now starting the channel, I was starting to learn like, Oh, who directed this? Oh, who wrote this manga? Stuff like that. And I think with that came a, you know, quote unquote, deeper appreciation of the culture and ultimately the sort of meta idea of what anime and manga is any thoughts on that math was yeah no i can definitely agree that like making uh discussions of it on you know like having a creative outlet to like explore these things definitely changes uh even ever so slightly it changes that perspective of kind of how you view whatever it is you're engaging with um I definitely think, uh, I guess for me, Shonen specifically is something I obviously gravitate towards. Uh, and the more I've kind of gone through stuff for the podcast and, um, you know, I've gotten I've gotten more of an idea of like what the the tropes are and kind of what the messages are that series and Shonen Jump specifically, but also in um, other Shonen manga, like what it kind of tries to say and the different ways that it can say that and... Um, so I think like having more of a knowledge of 
the specific storytelling uh i don't want to say genre but you know just different methods of storytelling Mm -hmm. uh in some ways it's genre but you know action stories slice of life romance whatever it may be just kind of getting more experience with each of these uh ways of storytelling you can kind of i don't know it gives you more of an appreciation of how do they like differ from each other like what do they do what what messages do they tell or um what tricks do they use to convey those messages and like what really uh Mm -hmm. makes them stand out in many ways i would consider you uh maybe you wouldn't but for lack of a better term i would consider you an expert on the shonen genre um and i feel like no quote-unquote genre invites as much baseless surface level criticism outside of maybe mech you know you can search all over youtube Mm -hmm. and find so many videos describing the issues of naruto bleach dragon ball whatever and and maybe some of them are legit some of them are fine but i feel like a lot of them are more misguided than anything so what i'm curious from you math is is with all that said what what is your take on the current state of modern shonen and like what are some things that you think genuinely it does really well nowadays and likewise some things that you think might be missing the mark i know we're speaking to a large category of stories here but just generally speaking it doesn't even need to be systematic just like you know you've noticed a weird pattern emerging emerging or something as far as as far as modern shonen goes i i don't feel like i'm actually the most uh well read on uh that specifically because right right now uh you know it's definitely dictated kind of by what the what we're doing on the podcast but right now we're going through more old school stuff uh Mm -hmm. so i'm definitely getting more of an appreciation for like where all this stuff kind of originated quote unquote although obviously those works themselves were inspired by things that came before them um Mm -hmm. but as far as like modern stuff goes um from what i have seen i definitely do think i don't know i guess things i i enjoy seeing um I mean, My Hero Academia had, like, the the concert. That was cool. That's not something you generally <laughs> see in, like, uh, in the more action-oriented stories. Um, Hiroaka, in particular, actually does a really good job, I think, of balancing um, the the action and the spectacle. But also, you know, it has, like, its formula where it'll go through a big bombastic fight arc, uh, rescue somebody arc, or, you know, the big climax plot thing. And then you have the the more grounded school activities where you get to focus more on the side characters and uh, it's just more laid back. And I do like that that balance of tone. Like it's it's able to kind of go back and forth. Um, whereas I think I, I don't know. It, it's not. I wouldn't quite call of, it, it like it's not doing the escalation thing, but it is finding a way to kind of I don't know. It's like finding a way to do the escalation while also keeping things. You know, keeping that. Uh, core you know like it's not losing where it began i guess if that makes sense Mm -hmm. so let me rephrase this and see if i'm picking up on what you're saying i would say when like when you bring up the concert stuff and the dorm life from my hero academia i would say maybe it's possible that modern shonen we're seeing a slight blend of it's and i i'll preface this by saying that like i'm not the biggest shonen head like i have not seen every you know mainstream shonen of the past 40 years but it seems like we might be shifting towards the blend of classic shonen with elements of slices, uh, slice of slice of life, rather. Uh, so it's like you wouldn't have gotten that concert twenty years ago, but the way modern shonen is, it seems to be appealing more to that. Uh, I don't know. Maybe I feel like emotional is not the right sensitive. I don't know. Well, it's, it's something along that line. Definitely taking the tropes that have been established. I mean, that's definitely one thing I like about modern shonen, but that can be the case for any sort of. Uh, era of shonen is that it builds on what came before and it finds different ways to to play with the formula play with the tropes that have been established but also you know reinvent the wheel or do something to 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 pass it forward to the next generation um and so perhaps in taking inspiration from like different uh styles of storytelling or uh (laughs) whatever it may be um I don't know. It, it, that's definitely like a core to Shonen Jump and Shonen stories in general that I really appreciate. That willingness to like carry the torch and pass it on, but mm-hmm. not you know, it's not just as simple as uh, 
taking directly from what came before and doing nothing to it because there are things that can be changed. There are things that can be improved on. Um, and you'll often see this reflected through the specific conflicts that are involved, whether it's uh, changing a corrupt system or whatever it may be. Um, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I feel what you're saying. Uh, I kind of want to – I have my own answer for this. It's a little bit shifting away from – because I feel like you really tackled the sort of the sort of thematic uh, development. I feel like shonen. I mostly just and, talked about why I like shonen as opposed to why I like modern shonen. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen. That was a perfectly fine answer. My answer, I kind of want to talk about shonen anime specifically because I've noticed recently that, you know – once we finished out with Naruto, and again, preface this with with me saying that uh, I have no idea what I'm talking about, really. So, <laughs> you know, uh, I I feel like outside of Boruto in One Piece, I feel like the shonen anime production has seemed to move away from year round, constant, you know, 52 episodes a year. Well, I don't even know if they were doing that many, but it was we've moved. It seems like the more popular shonen manga have been adapted into normal seasons, and it seems like you know. The biggest example of this for me would be The Promised Neverland, where I felt like that 12 episodes was a really perfect season. And I feel like what we were seeing with My Hero Academia, with Attack on Titan, The Promised Neverland, Dr. Stone, whatever, is that a lot of these shonen manga are getting more focused adaptations and we're getting less content, but that content is a lot stronger. It's a lot tighter. It's a lot higher production quality. I mean, I think we could look at Demon Slayer and look at how amazing that show looked disregarding whether or not we actually like the story but it was certainly an amazing looking show that we might not have gotten if demon slayer came out a decade ago because the adaptation process for demon slayer might have been different is that off base at all has it has have we always been experiencing stuff like that or am i right in saying that that seems to be a relatively new thing yeah no i definitely think that that is the trend that the that these anime adaptations are going towards uh because, you know, in those older series, you would occasionally get moments where, oh, here's a really, uh, really cool fight. You know, the Sakuga here is really on point. Um, mm -hmm. But it would be always in like those short bursts or maybe there'd be like a couple episodes in a row yeah. that are really good. But at some point, just by the nature of it being the kind of production it was, um, you know, it wasn't really feasible to keep that up. Whereas if it's more split out, structured, um, and I do think that there's interesting effects of that uh because you know there's all the discussion of like oh what's this generation's big three there really can't th like the conditions to create another big three as it was back in the early mid 2000s you, you can't really get that anymore because for those series they were all ongoing constant they were always a presence in the background um and, you know, so everybody would always be talking about them. And, you know, obviously, specifically, it was more of like outside of Japan. Those were the big series blowing up. Uh, whereas nowadays, Hiroaka might be popular. Demon Slayer might be popular, but it is seasonal. So that discussion will die down at a point and come back when the new season um, comes up. So I guess there's like, I don't even know that that's necessarily a bad thing that, does, that the discussion dies down from time to time. Um, but I, I don't know. It's, it's interesting to observe. I think we could all use a break from Demon Slayer every once in a while. <laughs> I don't think that's controversial to say. <laughs> uh, Zero, what is something that you love about modern shonen? Something I love about modern shonen. Uh, there's nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, you hate it all. You're, you hate shonen. <laughs> yeah, actually, just throw out shonen jump. Um, <laughs> as Mathwiz said, we definitely stand on the shoulders of giants. And I like seeing... Because I watched the uh, shonen anime or the battle shonen that were popular when I was growing up, I like seeing how they address uh, challenges that those shows had to deal with. Like, for example, uh, switching to the uh, seasonal production as opposed to the year-round production. And also sort of leaning away from filler which mm -hmm. has always b had a very uh, infamous reputation in anime communities as being something that can literally ruin a show. Of course, it's also the famous uh, original uh, Full Metal Alchemist example, where the show caught up completely to the manga and the rest of the show was completely divergent from the manga. That's mm -hmm. something that I couldn't picture happening again. 
but yeah, maybe it would. I, I definitely kinda feel wanna... like. Sorry, <clears throat> I def. I feel like um, we're sort of learning from our mistakes. I want to call attention to something because I think it ends up potentially going to something I dislike. I don't have the the data to back this up, but are we in a state where shonen manga seem to be getting shorter? Because we're talking about, you know, is there circumstances right now for a new big three? And it seems like there isn't. I feel like one of the things that might be attributing to that is the fact that Haikyuu recently just ended. And now the longest running shonen outside of Hunter x Hunter uh, that's currently running is My Hero Academia, which many people would consider and one, one of the newest. Piece. Yes, that's true. Sorry. Outside of Hunter x Hunter and One Piece, it is currently My Hero Academia. So it's... It feels like we might be at a point, we, we, we talk about Demon Slayer, Demon Slayer just ended. So it might be at a point where it feels like, uh, again, I don't have the data to back this up, but it feels like it might be the case that Shonen manga are wrapping up their stories pretty definitively and there isn't as much necessity to, you know, pad them out in any sort of way. I'm actually glad that the you promised brought... Neverland ended too. That's true, yeah. What were you saying about this? Yeah, I'm actually glad that uh, you brought this up because some people might say that that's a good thing, that uh, pacing is definitely something that has changed with uh, these specifically shown in action manga. Um, and for me personally, that's not necessarily... I mean, it has its pros and cons. Um, that's always mm-hmm. something I consider with Hiroaka because that's always coming in and out of discourse. Um, you know, I think that there are... There's a degree to which Hiroaka really makes that work, and I think that the pacing is one of its strengths. But at the same time, um, I know when the Shie Hasaikai arc uh, was animated, I was really looking for. I had that arc hype up, hyped up to me for a while as like, oh, this is one of the is is really, really good arc uh, overhaul. He's a big. It's my dude. favorite arc. Um, but for me personally, I remember when I finished watching that arc, I was kind of left with this feeling of like, that's it. This is Hiroaka's longest mm-hmm. arc to this point, and that's it. Like. I, I I don't know. It didn't feel. I didn't feel that same grand scale that something like the tuning exams or, you know. And obviously, I don't want to mention like final arcs because those are always huge. But um, Soul Society and Bleach, uh, One Piece arcs. You know, it didn't have that big bombast to it. Um, and that's a that's part of the appeal of what I like in in these stories is that you will get. You know, they are long running for some people. They don't vibe with that, but. For me personally, that's that's part of the appeal, seeing these gigantic storylines play out. And because of the fact that they're built up mm. so big, you get these big dramatic payoffs in the end. And they tend to hit all the harder because they've had so much time to be built up. Um, whereas with these newer manga, they tend to be shorter. They're wrapping up, which they're getting that conclusiveness that um, some people might not always feel that, you know, like when Naruto ended, when Bleach ended, people might have wanted more out of an ending um so it's definitely a a pro and con situation but i definitely am missing that scale uh that stuff like the big three and older manga would have i think we're completely in sync here because this is actually going to segue into the thing i dislike which is again i haven't done much research to back this up but i did pull up one fight from naruto and then a fight from demon slayer just to compare which is that I feel like arcs, like you're saying, they're getting so short. And particularly the one thing I want to harp on is fight scenes, which is that the Zabuza fight at the end of that Naruto arc, uh, including the Haku stuff and all that, was 23 to 33, which is 11 chapters. And you compare that to the climactic fight of Tanjiro versus Rui from Demon Slayer in season one, and that was only six chapters. Mm. That's about half the length. So we talk about, again, I, that, that was the only one I pulled. I, it might not be true if you look at all of them, but I felt like, this was something that I've, you know, anecdotally been feeling, which is that, and I, cause I've been rewatching Boruto, or not rewatching, but I've been watching some of Boruto too. And it's like, if this was a Naruto arc, this would have been 20 episodes longer. And that, that comes with downsides, mm-hmm. like you said, but it also does come with definitive positives, which is that you feel more invested. You feel like I've been with this so long that when it, when it ends, it is going to be very emotionally powerful for me. Hopefully. I mean, if they, if they do it well. So I do feel like, yeah, I, I do feel like there are definite pros and cons of, like, they are getting shorter, the story's getting more tight, and at the same time, it feels like we might be losing some stuff. We might not be getting the full emotional payoff that older manga, older anime have. This is interesting to me, because uh, I've completely read 
Masashi uh, Masashi Kishimoto's um, manga after Naruto, which was Samurai 8. Mm -hmm. And I was also, like, paying attention to the reception to it. And because it, like, had a start or sort of a starter, or, geez, sort of a slower startup, there were a lot of dissenters and a lot of people saying, like, this is going to get canceled. And ultimately it did. So it sort of feels like manga today doesn't have the same ability to like set things up it feels like it basically has to have exciting moments from the beginning which could contribute to this pacing issue or this pacing guess, shift an interesting question would be is it is it that current manga are failing to keep readers attention more than old manga did or is it that current readers have less of an attention span and, like, if Naruto was released today, would they be able to tolerate how slow it could be sometimes? Or So, like, is it a different of readers exactly. or material? What do you think about that, Mathis? No, yeah, I definitely think that that's a, that's a very fair point to bring up. Um, and I guess it could kind of tie into the way that people consume seasonal anime. Everybody, you know, really gets on the bandwagon for well, the anime when it's happening and then, you know, when it ends, people move on to the next thing. It's all about, like, being part of, like, the community discussion. Um, and me, me personally, I've kind of been disconnected from the seasonal scene for quite a while. I've, I've only recently kind of been going back to stuff from 2019 and just catching up. Um, and I don't know. It's, it's definitely interesting that way because you will... Um, oh, I guess that's just the case for anything in history is that, you know, the cream will rise to the top. You know, people might all be talking about ReZero when it's airing in 2016, but, you know, when will it come back? Well, it's back in 2020, and people are talking about it again. Uh, that, I don't know why I brought that example up. Um, but just, like, <laughs> in general, like, if people are still talking about a seasonal anime from 2013 or whatever, uh, then, it, you know, regardless of it being... You know, some people will say that, like, there are no modern classics. But, you know, as time passes, more things will stand up. But uh, as far as, like long-running stories and people not having the patience or i don't know it's just like how people might consume things to consume things uh they want that that quick burst they really want things to be engaging right off the bat and really like you know might not have the investment for that i guess uh, yeah i don't really i haven't done any research into this i don't have any like statistics to back up my point yeah. but i do think that you know it's it's an observation that like i can see i can understand it uh maybe there's something to it yeah, so I, the one thing I would say here, again, I will back up your point here in that uh, we are not, we have no idea what we're talking about. <laughs> we, we really don't know anything. But I will say one thing that could be attributed to this is that where we exist as anime fans now is a very different culture from where we would have existed as anime fans uh, back in 2000, in the early 2000s. You know, right now we exist with Crunchyroll and Netflix, where anime is consistently available to us at a rate that people can't possibly consume. I do not understand how people watch every seasonal. It just does not make sense to me. But we are very saturated in that way. As to where, when we were younger, and this is not a back-in-my-day thing, but when we were younger, it was like, okay, you have the, what, eight shows that Toonami airs, and that was it. So <laughs> what, what choice did you have hey, to some of us had Funimation. the stuff? That's true, yes. Funimation did exist. But it was, at the very least, you could say that it was... Uh, yeah, so, it was a less saturated field. Yeah, so it was slimmer pickings. You would take what's given to you, and you would follow it for however long the journey was, because that that was your option. Is basically what you're saying. Yeah, pretty much. Zero. Is there anything that you wanted to call out, or did we ever go over? Did we already go over what you dislike about modern shonen? Mm, there's really not much that I think is plaguing modern shonen. I I do feel like there's more of an interest in sequel shows nowadays like boruto and dragon ball super possibly because of this difficulty in getting invested in new material mm -hmm. but i feel like a lot of the changes i've noticed in oh okay there is one thing and this is more like not enough of a shift has happened which is that i feel like there's still sort of uh an underuse of female characters Mm -hmm. it seems like like Uraraka even the uh, what many consider to be the best newest sh or battle shonen 
the most prominent female character in that show is a complete she's completely on the bench in recent uh mm-hmm. arcs and yeah it's definitely something you could see getting better but at such a incrementally slow rate that it's still if you if you didn't know that it was getting better it would still just look so so bad yeah i mean there is noel in black clover and other ca- uh, counter examples i'm sure but i would like to see less characters getting compared to sakura the one that always gets me <laughs> And I've been thinking about this a lot. I know I've been harping on Demon Slayer a lot, but my my aunt is going through Demon Slayer for the first time. So I've been tagging in to watch a couple of episodes every now and then. And the one thing that bothers me about, you know, sort of going along with this is that Nezuko in Demon Slayer has such a good opportunity for stealing the spotlight of that You're show. Right. Because she should, she should be more powerful than Tanjiro. And on a simple level, I think being a powerful character... Uh, allows for really dynamic, interesting fights. Uh, I think she is a very cute character design. But so often, and this is this is one of the things that bothered me immediately when I first rewatched it, is she became infantilized. I don't know how to pronounce that word. She became she was supposed to be like, you know, the second eldest of this of the children when the show started, and then she turns into a demon and now she's indistinguishable from a literal toddler and she doesn't <laughs> obviously she doesn't get many lines. Uh It seems almost entirely that her character is just to be cute, and then every once in a while she may do something that, you know, like save Tanjiro in some way or another. But I find that character to be be one of the most underutilized characters in that entire show, and I have no idea why. I definitely agree with you on this. Um, Like, I understand that she has, like, a a thematic role, and she, she, you know, her being the way that she is, you know, it there's something there. Um, But at the same time, you know, like it, it, it's a role for her doesn't necessarily mean that I have to like the role um, mm-hmm. because I remember going through it for the first time and, you know, the fact that she gets turned into this like demon girl, like you'd think that would there's something you could do with that. Like that's a, a power system, maybe, or like something you could I don't even necessarily ne- mean to say that she needs to be stronger than Tanjiro, but like. She, she, we, we see that she can fight. You know, she decapitates a dude in like episode two. She fights the, she mm-hmm. participates in that one fight, uh, with the character I don't remember, but she doesn't, like. <laughs> so there are moments where she does stuff, but I feel like she, she could do more. Like I under, I still understand that the, um, the familial like protection thing, like you can still do that and also have the character do more, um. Yeah, there's just as on the topic of female characters in Shonen in general, there's I would love to do a video about this because while I do understand that some people, I think, uh, take their criticisms or potential like pros for a character a little too far. Um, you know, there was like an article a while back talking about like how uh, Uraraka breaks the, the Shonen female lead curse when in reality um, she the things that they praise her for she doesn't actually really uh there are there are other characters who do the things that she's being praised for better uh who existed before Mm her um so like i understand that there are you know some people maybe go too far that it's like oh there are no strong female characters in jump um but there definitely i do think there is legitimacy to the point that um, these characters can be confined to very specific kind of roles, or even when they are combat focused, uh, they don't. You know, like there's still more that they that they, that could be done with them. Like, um, I was gonna say a point that I always kind of bring up with Naruto is that um, th- these female characters they are fighters. They do uh, participate in fights earlier on, but then like as it gets further, they're just like. And it's also part of how Naruto is structured, that it's very much a story about Naruto, about Sasuke, about, um, you know, none of these female characters necessarily, like, play into that in the same kind of way. Or Not that they don't. Uh, I'm kind of butchering my phrasing here. But, it. but yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, these characters are point. combat focused, but by way of being combat focused, they almost get pushed to the side, just like every other side character, because we can only focus on so many, you know, fighters. So in that case, it would be like having someone in a non-combat role might have made them more relevant to the story. Somebody like uh, Komugi mm-hmm. from the Chimera Ant arc. She's a non-combatant, but she's one of the most vital characters of the arc. Um, 
So there's definitely like nuance. Yeah. By being a non-combatant, she stands out from all the other combatants. I get what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. And Naruto is probably a really great example because because the show becomes so focused on Naruto and Sasuke and how much stronger they get than every single other character in that entire franchise. Yeah, yeah. so it it's not even just like... them. You know, like, the same could go for Shikamaru or Shino or, you know, any side character. Like, they get pushed to the side just like everybody yeah, else. Yeah, I was going to make this point, and I brought up the female characters first because I feel like it's especially egre- uh, egregious with them, but it does seem like modern shonen are shifting towards more side characters and developing them less. <laughs> like, <laughs> the original Dragon Ball cast is still around in Super, and they were there for most of Z, though they eventually got pushed out for more Saiyans. And mm-hmm. with Naruto, Kiba is not relevant at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I guess maybe we were right on the nose when... You said at the beginning, Zero, maybe Shonen just is bad, and maybe we just need to do away with it. <laughs> <laughs> the thing I dislike about Shonen is I just I just don't. <laughs> just nothing. There's nothing great about it. Let's get it over it with. It exists. Let's close out with our final segment. We've had a very long, very uh, thoughtful discussion. Now I just want to do something really easy. We're going to do a quick shout out to new things in the anime sphere right now that we think should be paid a little more attention to, whether that's be whether that'd be like... Uh, a fan art you recent, recently saw, an analysis video that just came out, or even just an anime that people are sleeping on. Zero, what is something cool happening right now in anime that you think people need to check out? Chainsaw Man. It actually doesn't have an anime adaptation yet, but it's getting a lot of buzz in Shonen Jump, and it's definitely going to get an anime adaptation, and it's going to be amazing. What's give me the Give me the elevator pitch, I guess. Okay, so... This is a world where there are humans and devils, and uh, humans can, like, form contracts with devils to get powers, but the main character sort of becomes, like, half devil, half human. So, uh, essentially, uh, he's also kind of, like, dumb. I think he grew up homeless or something, so he has, like, no education, and his only goal in life is to touch some boobs great so what we were just talking about with the female representation this one is clearly breaking that mold and bringing in it that is new because... strong female power we needed right yes ironically it is because um his like uh because his goal is so oriented around the existence of women there are or female characters do play much more of a role in the plot uh Mostly as manipulators, so I guess it's not that positive. <laughs> but well, you know, it's they're worth there. Checking out, yeah. <laughs> it, yeah. It, being in existence is a step above what we're currently at, perhaps. So, uh, I will give mine real quick. Uh, I have a bit of a meme one, and then I have a serious one, which is uh, if you haven't seen the SpongeBob anime episode that uh, recently <laughs> came out. Uh, I would say that is a very fun watch, and uh, I, I I really admire the amount of work it probably took to make that. Uh, uh, so I would check that out. And then the serious one I want to give a shout out to is uh, there's a sports anime that I might make a video about that no one is watching that I think uh, if you could just what we're talking about, just give it a little bit of your attention more than you might already. It's really worth it. A Hero no Sora, I think, is one of the best sports anime I've ever seen. And obviously, I I think very highly of sports anime. I have a high Q, a high Q tattoo. I love Kuroko. I think A Hero no Sora is up there. Unfortunately, it's not popular enough to get fully translated. The manga only has like 150 out of like 500 plus. It's one of the longest running manga that people haven't heard about i think it's it's really quite significant but uh go watch a hero nosora if the anime gets enough popularity maybe we get more of the manga and uh that'd be great very great for me See, that's really interesting because right. i've just been watching the other anime from that season which is hoshi ai no sora or stars align um and i remember <laughs> hearing about uh ahiru no sora um but it wasn't what i never like heard much discussion about it um it's it's deceptively good is what i'd say because i watched the first episode and thought okay that's interesting but i'm not really i don't really care so i dropped it and then for some reason i don't even really know why for some reason i picked it back up and i hate saying this because i really i really do think 
stories need to compete for your attention. I do think if it doesn't grab you right away, you don't owe it your time. But for some reason, I gave it, I gave it a lot of my time, and I got by. You get to episode seven or eight, and I think it starts to show why this is running as long as it has been, why this is so significant, and why this can be a really, really great anime. I think you look at it, and it seems a little generic, and I think, you know, listen, I'm not saying that's not fair. I'm just saying, if you can get past that, if you can dedicate some of your time to it, I personally am really impressed with it. I know I convinced Zero to watch some of it. Zero doesn't love it as much as me, but Zero, you do you do quite enjoy it, correct? Yeah, I think it has a really strong premise, strong enough to get you through like the slower initial episodes, and once you're into it, I think it's a pretty solid ride. If I could just, if I give a simple pitch, it is very much an underdog sport, a sports anime from a perspective that most underdog sports anime aren't. You know, Haikyuu is an underdog sports anime to some degree. That's how they frame it, arguably. Uh, but Haikyuu, Karasuno is a very good team. A Hironosaurus team is not. They are very bad. <laughs> but yeah. I think there's a lot of juicy drama that comes with that. There's a lot of, it's it's centered around these, you know, uh, people who aren't really, like they're kind of thugs. They're, you know, they skip school all the time. And it's kind of finding themselves through basketball and finding it's it's kind of like run with the wind. I don't know if either of you watched that, but run with the wind came out last year. It's not exactly like that, but it's, I would say it's a mix between run with the wind and high and you get here in Osora. I think it's fantastic. So uh, if you have, I don't know, if you have eight episodes to spare, give this your time. That's, Math that's was, definitely what do you a want good to company out? you're recommending it with. Um, well, my recommendation, uh, it's a YouTube channel. Uh, it's called uh, Kato, or maybe Kato. I've heard both pronunciations. Um, they're right now doing... Uh, <laughs> no, you were right classics. the first time. Um, you might have heard of them. Um, they make good videos. <laughs> okay. I, I, I feel terrible about uh, having to say this out loud right when you mention it. Unfortunately, uh, we failed Year of Classics. There was no video this month. Uh, we just... We didn't quite get around to it, I guess. Uh, so screw us. Oh. Uh, we disappointed all of you. I am so sorry. Oh, no. They had a solid <laughs> six months of classics. Honestly, I mean, like, you <laughs> ended on a banger, though. Like that Legend of the Galactic Heroes video. Chef's kiss. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank well you. appreciated. Is that your real shout out? Or do you have a, do you have a not terrible one? Um, <laughs> I don't know how recent you'd call it, but... Um, Read the Bloom into You manga. Volume 8 is about to be mm, published officially. Yes. It's coming out. Um, and uh, I'm going to make a video on it. And it's a, it's a very big video. It's an important video. So read the manga or watch the anime. Do both. They're both great. Uh, and then, yeah, wait for my video, which will come out yeah. maybe this year. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to second the Bloom into You recommendation. I watched the 12 episodes of the anime that is out. I think that is... Uh, in time, that will probably become one of my favorite uh, anime. I think it is so beautiful, and I think these characters are so sad, and <laughs> but in a good way, not like <laughs> not sad in a bad way. <laughs> it's it's an anime that uh, makes me tear up. I don't know if it got me to cry, but I definitely uh, started getting close. All right, I think that's gonna do it for this week's episode of Kato's Anime Cafe. I want to give a quick shout out again to this week's sponsors. Thank you, Writer Junkie and the Tax Defense Group, for sponsoring the Anime Cafe, and thank you to everyone listening. You can catch us uploading every Monday to UCast Studios YouTube channel or your favorite podcast apps. I have been your host, Hoodie Song, with my partner, Zero. Thank you again for joining us, MathWiz. Until next time. Sayonara.